Welcome to Biology Minds. Today we're going to talk about organic analysis and instrumentation in forensic science. So when we talk about forensic science uh, and we're talking about instrumentation, there are a number of ways to identify different uh, chemicals, different substances. So, um, you know, whenever you come to a crime scene, typically people want to just assume that if they see uh, something that's red, that that's going to be blood or, you know, something that's white, it's going to be semen. Um, but that's just not the case. We have to test these things. So, you know, yeah, you, you, you're you going to find some, uh, you know, maybe a red gas canister and you're going to think that that's gasoline, but we have to test it to make sure that it is gasoline. What type of gasoline is it? Is it super? Is it regular? Is it diesel gasoline? Maybe it's kerosene. We don't know. Even if it's labeled a certain way, we can't assume. So we do have to run the, these uh, tests in order to know what specifically that chemical is. So this goes more into the chemistry component of forensic science. Remember that when we talk about matter, all right, that's going to be anything that is composed of atoms or molecules. So everything is made up of matter. Everything's going to be made up of, of atoms. And atoms make up the molecules, and the molecules will make up the compounds um, or their elements um, if all the atoms are the same. So we typically are looking at these compounds, and we're trying to identify the specific compound that they are by using this instrumentation um, in order to... Uh, better understand the evidence that we have at hand. So there's two broad groups of compounds that we look at. We look at inorganic and organic. And the big thing to remember is that when we're talking about organic, it has carbon with hydrogen. So if it does not have carbon with hydrogen, then it is going to be considered inorganic. So something can have carbon, something can, can, can have hydrogen, but if it doesn't have both of them together, then it is going to... Uh, be inorganic. So also typically we see that there is oxygen involved. There is, so these organic compounds have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they don't need oxygen necessarily for them to be considered organic. So in identifying substances in the crime scene, you're um, you know you're going to send these organic substances, whether it's drugs, fibers, petroleum products, paint explosives, you're going to send them to the lab, and then the lab is going to have to use these instruments in order to identify the specific substance. Some methods that we talk about, spectrophotometry, it's going to be characterizing substances based on the absorption of light. Chromatography is going to separate components in a mixture to be identified. So we're going to separate the different components. So just because, uh, you know, when we look at paper chromatography and we're separating pigments, well, yeah, you see a green pigment, but maybe that green pigment is made up of a number of other pigments, and we're going to separate those out in order to identify each component of that mixture. Some things to consider. Henry's law, all right, big law in chemistry. Volatile chemical compounds that are dissolved in liquid will constantly go from gas to liquid and liquid to gas as it searches for an equilibrium. Even at equilibrium, the state of matter changes, but at a constant ratio. So the greater the solubility of the gas, the longer it stays in that liquid form. When we talk about gas chromatography, similar to uh, paper chromatography, we are separating those mixtures into its components and it separates highly complex mixtures into components in minutes so we have a moving phase which is a carrier gas All right so we need to take our sample and we need that sample to uh, be uh, put into a, a carrier gas to push the mixtures through a series of tubes which are our fixed phase or our stationary phase made of stainless steel or often glass, and these are referred to as our columns. So we have our moving phase, which is our gas, which is moving through our fixed or stationary phase, which are our, our columns, and that is how we're separating these mixtures. All right, The, the different components of the mixtures are going to move at a different rate, and that's how we're going to separate the different components of that mixture. So different components move at different rates, like I said. As it is separated, it enters a, an attached detector. One common type of detector uses a flame to ionize. So they're going to ionize the substances that come through those columns to create an electrical signal producing a readout called a chromatograph. So we're reading this chromatograph and it uses retention time. All right, how long does it take for that specific substance in the mixture to come through the column in order uh, 
as a way to identify the specific substances. So this is, uh, you know, used for, for many different substances, but, you know, some of the things that it cannot use is paint chips because paint chips, we're not going to be able to dissolve them into li liquid. Same goes for plastics and fibers. So very helpful with many other mixtures or components um, or substances, but we cannot use them for, we cannot use gas chrom chromatography for paint chips or plastics or fibers. This is a diagram showing you that we have our carrier gas and we are pushing it through these columns and then what comes out is going to be read by the detector and we're going to use that to analyze our substance. And the detector might give a readout like this and it'll show you these different peaks and just by knowing at where they peak in the time sequence we, we can figure out what exactly are they. So if um, it peaks around 500, we'll say, oh, well, that's typical of DDT. And that's how we can uh, understand or, or identify that um, that substance is that pesticide DDT. Another type of chromatography, um, a, lot, a lot of times just called pyrolysis, but it, its full name is pyrolysis gas chromatography, another type of gas chromatography. It's going to heat substances to over 500 de degrees and it creates a vapor for testing those things that we cannot use in regular gas chromatography. Paint chips, plastics, and fibers, by heating those up to over 500 degrees Celsius, it's going to turn those, vaporize them, and then we can push them through the gas chrom chrom the pyrolysis gas chrom chromatography. Another type is high performance liquid chromatography. Moving phase is a liquid, and the fixed phase or stationary phase is um, uses the solid particles. Useful for heat sensitive materials, so we don't want to put those heat sensitive materials into pyrolysis. We're going to use high performance liquid chromatography for these heat sensitive materials. Some uh, heat sensitive materials that we talk about um, that you're going to want to test at room temperature. Big one is explosives, but also LSD, all right, acid. When people drop acid, that drug that is um, heat sensitive, so you're going to want to use HPLC. And also antibiotics is another one. Thin layer chromatography that we actually uh, can experiment with. Um, the moving phase is a liquid and the stationary phase is a solid gel coated plate. Very similar to paper chromatography where you have that liquid moving up the paper. This has a liquid moving up this gel coated plate. Often need ultraviolet light in order to reveal the substances that fluoresce um, on that plate. Uh, inexpensive. Uh, people still use it. A lot of times you hear about people saying that, you know, it's archaic and, and there's there's some labs that, that don't really use it anymore because the substances that they test with it, they can use another uh, instrument for, another machine for, but it is still relevant. It, can, it is still very helpful and it is in, inexpensive. So a place like, uh, you know, the city of Newburgh, if they want to use this, they can still use this. Uh, need a comparative plate for final step in order to, you know, see where, you know, what these substances are. But you can measure the RF value just like you can with paper chromatography. So just like with paper chromatography, if this was our paper, we could see how the mixture separates into its components. The same thing goes for this thin layer chromatography where it's moving up this gel plate. Gel electrophoresis, which we'll talk about more when we get into talking about DNA, but this is actually used to separate DNA. So DNA is an organic molecule. It's a nucleic acid, and we're going to be able to separate this using this electrical potential uh, through a gel, and it's going to separate these these uh, this DNA into different parts. So useful in separating components of blood but you need a control for comparison as well. So with, with you know, both the thin layer chromatography, the TLC and the gel electrophoresis, you, if you want to do these tests, you need a, a control for comparison. Spectrophotometry, light moves in waves, which is categorized on the electromagnetic spectrum using wavelengths and frequency. Spectrophotometry measures the absorption spectrum of a chemical substance. So by separating those components and then um, looking at the, the wavelengths, we'll be able to identify the specific substance that it is. Ultraviolet spectrophotometry and visible spectrophotometry, they give simple readouts of absorption of light as a function of frequency. 
infrared spectrophotometry creates more complex patterns on readouts. Ultimately, it's like a fingerprint for that substance. So if we have a control for a substance, we can use that control in order to say, see that, hey, you know, it's the same exact fingerprint for this uh, mystery substance. So we know that it has to be the same substance. Gives you a readout. So if this readout, if we have this control, this we know that this is vanillin, and this is our control, and then we run another a test on some mystery uh, substance, and it comes out with this same readout. Then we know, hey, this is its fingerprint. If it has the same exact readout, that means that this is also, or the mystery substance is also vanillin. Mass spectrometer. All right, this is very important. This is the mainstay of all forensic science labs. So without uh, a mass spectrometer in a forensic science lab, you don't really have a forensic science lab. This is the end all be all most important part of a forensic science lab. The mass spectrometer coupled with the, the uh, gas chromatography, we call it GCMS, all right, gas chromatography mass spectrometer by putting these two things together all right it, it helps us to identify countless different substances so the gas chroma chromatography is going to feed the mass spectrometer to identify components of a mixture so the gas chromatography is going to break up those components in a mixture and send it to the mass spectrometer for the mass spectrometer to then identify the components of the mixture by shooting a beam, beam of high energy electrons at it and that's going to separate the particles by specific mass. And by knowing the specific mass of those particles, we can identify those particles. So in the forensic science lab, you need a GCMS machine. You need that gas chromatograph, uh, chromatograph with the mass spectrometer. So when we talk about these different types of instruments that are used in the forensic science lab, you want to understand that the GCMS is the most important, right? So keep these things in mind as we move forward in, in the year, as we get start talking more about uh, different um, substances that you find at the crime scene, as well as when we start talking about DNA and, and DNA evidence.